In experiment M1, we're going to establish the instrument error associated with taking a device at random and measuring something with it. Uh, systems of measurement generally depend on three things. Measurements of distance, measurements of time, and measurements of either mass or force depending on the system and pretty much everything else can be related back to these measurements. First thing we're going to look at is measurement of distance and one of the simplest devices for doing that is the measuring stick. And I have several meter sticks here and one of the first things I want to emphasize is that these are not all identical. For one thing they're made out of wood. Wood is not perfectly stable and it may vary a little bit in size depending upon the moisture content and other factors. So let me take these meter sticks here and, and we'll set them so that the bottom ends here are all at exactly the same place. And then let's take a look at the other end. Oops, we obviously have an outlier here. Somehow a yardstick crept in with our meter sticks, so let's get that out of there. Now, these are all genuine A number one meter sticks, so let's line them up. So we would expect them all to be exactly the same length. Now let's look. Well, in fact, they're not all identical. There's a variation of maybe two or three millimeters in the length of these meter sticks. A part of that is because the ends may be worn off. So one of the first things to remember in using a meter stick is do not measure from the end since it will produce a zeroing error. So when we're utilizing a meter stick we want to pick some point say the 10 centimeter mark here and take our measurements from that and then we'll carefully record that we did that so that we can later subtract that 10 centimeters. Now another thing about using a meter stick is the fact that parallax error may occur. For example, if I want to measure the length of this line ruled across this piece of paper. If I lay the meter stick down like this, then the measuring marks are not in the same plane as the thing I want to meet to measure. So that the value I get depends on where I place my eye. And that's not good. Normally, this parallax error is random, but it can sometimes be systematic. Uh, when I was a feckless high school student with a new driver's license, my parents had a car that had a 10 mile per hour parallax error if you were sitting in the passenger seat. Uh, and it was always on the high side. So you can see that parallax errors can be extremely serious. So, the way to avoid this is to make sure that the marks are as nearly as you can place them to the thing being measured. So you always turn it up on edge like this. Let me measure this from say the 20 centimeter mark right here. And that places the other end at about 50.6. Another thing about measuring with analog devices is that you always mentally subdivide the smallest division into 10 parts and estimate to the nearest tenth. Now we won't always estimate the same tenth, but at least we do get one additional digit, which is generally significant. On this measurement right here, I would estimate that to be 50.62. So I'll record that as 50.62 minus 20 
centimeters. For more precise measurements than can be obtained with the meter stick, uh, we use various types of calipers. And for precision, they depend not on estimating the last tenth of the smallest division, but on the use of something called a vernier scale, which helps us read that fraction. And to demonstrate how that works, I have this device right here. It has this sliding scale, and then it has a main scale down here divided, in this case, into centimeters. So these are centimeters. Now the vernier scale, which is this one, has 10 divisions that occupy the same length as nine divisions of the main scale. That means each of these divisions on the vernier is nine tenths as large as the divisions on the main scale. So if we start here at the zero end of the vernier, and I move it over until the number one mark lines up with a main scale mark, I've moved the vernier one-tenth of a division. When the second mark lines up, sticky, I've moved it two-tenths. When the third mark lines up, I've moved it three-tenths. The fourth mark, four-tenths. The fifth mark, five-tenths. And finally, when the number 10 mark lines up, I've moved it one division of the main scale. And then we can start over. When the number one mark lines up now, it's 1.1. So if I were going to measure the length of my pen, I can see that here's 10, 11, 12, 13 centimeters. It's larger than 13 centimeters, but smaller than 14. Now, I could estimate the number of tenths, but the vernier scale allows me to look down here until I find the mark. In this case, it's number six that's perfectly aligned with some main scale mark. So the reading here would be 13.6 centimeters. 10 division verniers are probably the most common ones, but they're not the only ones used. Here are three different vernier calipers. Here's a rather inexpensive one, which has a 10 division vernier scale. Here's a somewhat more precise one, in which there are 20 divisions on the vernier scale. And then one with even more pretensions yet, which has 50 divisions on the vernier scale. Now, in your laboratory manual, there are close-up pictures of all three of these type scales, and they will give you some hints on how to read them, but basically they work the same way. If we're going to measure something, there are several types of measurements that can be taken. There are inside jaws whose purpose is to take measurements like this, inside measurements. There are outside jaws whose purpose is to take outside measurements like this. And in case you want to measure from an outside to an inside, like this step, you can use the depth rod and take a measurement like that. And in each case, the measurement you want is read at the zero mark of the vernier. In this case, it's a little past 2.2 centimeters and it looks like the 4.6 mark uh, is the best aligned one, so the reading would be 2.246. Centimeters and tenths read off the main scale, 
using the zero mark of the vernier and then the last two digits come off the vernier scale itself. In this one here with the 50 mark, it divide, the vernier scale divides each millimeter of the main scale into 50 parts. So in other words, multiples of 0.02 millimeters or 0.002 centimeters. The triple beam balance is commonly used in our laboratories to measure mass and it functions very simply. It has three beams with poise weights. Um, you might think the best way to leave this when you're done is balanced. In fact, that's generally not ideal for two reasons. Having all the weight at this end puts a great deal of force on the pivot points, plus air currents in the room will let it move slightly, both of which contribute to wear of the support bearings. So in fact, when you're done with the beam balance, it's a good idea to move the largest poise weight over there to take some of the weight off of the supports and keep it from moving. But when you get ready to measure, put them all back to zero. Check to see that the indicator zeroes. If not, there's a adjustable counterweight here that will set that. Place the object you want to measure in the pan. Start with the largest poise. Move it, always making sure it stops in one of the notches. When you've moved it too far, go back one. Then start with the next notch. Okay, that's too much. So let's go back to here. And finally, Now well, let's call that good. We'd read that 300 plus 40 plus 8.7 and it's about 7 tenths of the way to the next mark. So 348.77. Now occasionally an object will be too large for the poise weights, in which case you'll need to use one of the auxiliary masses and hang it right here in the ring on the end support. Now, if you have to do that, uh, you may be confused by the two numbers here on the weight. Uh, one says one kilogram, the other one says 295 grams actual. What that means is the 295 gram mass of this auxiliary weight this far from the balance will counterbalance a kilogram here in the pan this far from the balance. So whenever you have to use this, you add the larger number to the masses on the three poises. So take the object you've been assigned, find its weight on each balance in the room, and record all of those. In this case I had 348.77. Once you have completed all of this, turn this paper into your GTA and he will collate all the data and you can then analyze it. 